All right, there are a series of assignments that are due uh, later this week. So we have two small assignments that are due by Saturday of this week and then Tuesday of next week. And then there's there are two solutions, a Monte Carlo simulation and data mining. I, I'd just like to take a moment to walk through each of these with you. So that you was there a question? Uh, let's see. Oh. All right. So this one is due by the start of class this Thursday. First assignment we just walked through is due this Thursday. Please go ahead and take care of that promptly. By the end of this week, what we'd like you to do is to finish or polish off the descriptive statistics assignment. We have a separate assignment for inferential statistics. So each of these are worth two points. The macro is two points, this is two points, and that's two points. And uh, what we'd like to do by this time next week is to make sure that everybody's had a chance to engage the descriptive statistics and inferential statistics assignments. Any questions about when the assignments are due? Let's talk about the solution. Not this Saturday, but by next Saturday, we want you to finish each of two solutions. So you have, this is really uh, sort of a, a double module from the sense that the hands-on part, uh, there's a lot, there's a good bit more hands-on. And uh, these are all guided assignments and solutions. So there are videos that accompany these, but essentially if you read the PDF first and then watch the YouTube, it'll make a lot more sense. But what we want to do is take advantage of Excel power and then create a large number of random values that we use to perform a Monte Carlo simulation. So modeling, right? Yeah. And so the first solution is due not this Saturday, but next Saturday. Uh, notice there's no time. So as long as it's completed by 11.59 p.m., you're fine. There's also a data mining uh, solution. If we take the access experience that you've gained with a simple creation of a basic SQL database, and we turn it on its ear, essentially what we want you to do is to take some of the examples in your textbook, but but basically apply those in the context of an access database. And we want you to get a taste for what we mean by data mining. So if you build a database and you create some SQL queries to identify patterns, that's a certain level of database analysis or data analysis. But what, but what happens if you if you query, if you query the queries, if you compound the queries where you generate a first set of results and then take it a step further, take it several iterations deeper. In that case, you're performing something that's referred to as data mining, where you're doing deeper analysis for complex or compound SQL uh, queries, right? Structured queries against those data sets. And what we'd like to do is take advantage of the example that uh, that's used in that textbook. Now, when you watch the videos, you'll find that the resolution on the videos isn't, isn't that great. So what I've done is provided an, ep an extra folder here called high resolution screenshots. And as you read the solution requirements and the rubric, so that you can check your own work to see if if you've met requirements, right? Then these are examples of things you should see when you uh, get to each milestone in your solution. So if you click into this, 
what you'll see is a duplication of the auctions example that's in your textbook, except that we use live data. And we provide uh, data files for input. So you can import those instead of enter those manually. And then once your tables are built, you can create relationships between the tables and then create queries. In any case, these examples are uh, have much better resolution. So if you want to, if you're looking at something in the video and you find out that it's hard to make out, all you have to do is go into the high resolution screenshots folder and each of the numbered descriptions correspond with which part of the solution you're working, okay? So what do we mean by that? 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 3, 4A, B, and C. If I go to this part of my rubric and I go inside, essentially, here's the rubric. And uh, each step, right? Each step is uh, explained about what's what's required. And uh, when you look at the assignments document, the assignments document uh, breaks it down into each of those tasks as well, right? So if you follow along here, the numbers uh, track with the references. All right. So this is the you know this is basically a link to the same. It's a, it's the YouTube, and and you have uh, screenshots based on, it's based on the links. Any questions about our solutions? So one of the things, one of the value added parts about our, um, our module is that there's additional information that's, uh, that you should take the time to review in our, in our screen here. In the resources and references folder for module four, you'll find miscellaneous notes on data analysis methods, right? And this information is essentially uh, really important to review because, because it provides context. It, it um, explains a scenario and then there are usually questions, right? So here you see there's a couple of questions on, on how standard deviation is calculated. If you are to read through the study guide or watch some of the videos, uh, some of that you'll pick up pretty quickly, but um, these short and related references are really helpful when it comes to understanding the process. So I would encourage you to take the time you need to um, pull each of these up. If they're in there, they're important, okay? If they're in the resources folder, if they're a reference, uh, if they're in the references folder in particular, that's the kind of stuff that you're going to see. Well, you're going to see assessment items on and final exam items, right? So if you if you see a reference to scatter plots and histograms in this in this particular document, the odds are really pretty good you're going to see some items about scatter plots and histograms and what they are and what they do and how they work, right? Variance and standard deviation, we explain all of that. A lot of statistics is not as mysterious as it seems, as long as you have uh, a little bit of time where you can focus and then follow an example through. So we talk about variance and then standard deviation and what that means. Some of the things that trip up students are the definitions like you square the differences for each of the values and calculate the mean. That is literally the definition 
of something we call a variant, right? And that's a that's a, a descriptive a descriptive statistical method, quantitative in nature, that tells us specific things about the data that we're analyzing. Any questions about our material for module four? Much of this is self-paced. So if you get started and uh, dive in, you could be finished in a week and uh, take your time getting ready for the final exam and with retakes. Um, you do want to cover a good bit of the material before you get into the assignments and solutions. That's just one recommendation I'd make. In a sense, in module three, uh, we were talking about qualitative interests for data, right? And now, now we're talking about, so when we say qualitative interests, we're talking about the SQL database. Uh, structured query um, methods for uh, non-numerical data uh, helps us identify relationships between data sets. And so this is considered to be a qualitative uh, method. And that's what we did in module three. But now in module four, we're going to come full circle. We're going back to quantitative analysis, right? And quantitative analysis has those two different flavors. And they're one of them is centered on qualitative aspects that the certain type of uh, relationship, right? Now, inferential statistics helps scientists to understand the probability that a set of outcomes, two or more data sets, or two or more populations differ or are similar, meaning that there is some manner of relevant relationship. I'd like to repeat that. I know it's it's really kind of um, basic here, but when we talk about descriptive statistics, we're talking about numerical analysis like mean and mode and standard deviation, min, max, you know, all that, right? And then inferential statistics, what we're doing is understanding how likely, the likelihood or probability that a set of outcomes reflects a relationship between two or more data sets. It is discovering a relationship between uh, two components in a set of data that allow scientists to discern and to discover new things in the world. And put another way, we can observe and measure natural phenomena in, in nature. And then when we measure those uh, phenomena and then analyze them, we discover that oftentimes some of the criteria of our measurements um, bear out relationships. So there's a pattern that evolves from the analysis that reveals, oh, uh, temperature is related to the amount of moisture the air can hold. So as an example, when the air temperature increases, in, in most uh, masses of air, when the temperature of a gas increases, in particular, the atmosphere of Earth, when we have hotter air, it can hold more moisture. But if we cool the air, if the temperature of that air decreases, the amount of moisture that it can hold uh, diminishes rapidly, right? So there's, there's a relationship between the temperature of the air mass and the amount of raw moisture, the, the amount of water vapor, the amount of clouds that you can store up in, in, uh, in the atmosphere. It's one reason why some storms can pack more water than others. That relationship is a great example, a great example of a pattern that's reliable and predictable. And as we analyze that pattern in nature, we find out that its predictability is so solid, we can model, we can use that relationship, that re, that um, that, that uh, definition of relationship between those two quantities 
and then we can do some modeling to see what would happen. Okay, if uh, there's global warming, if the average temperature increases by two degrees, what does that mean in terms of the amount of water that a hurricane can, can hold if there's global warming as opposed to cooling, right? Now, apart from the uh, apart from the statistics, right? You have a third possibility. Um, when we're talking about modeling, it's not it's not readily apparent at first how far you can take modeling. I, I just mentioned a case where you have a natural phenomenon and you measure the outcomes and then you perform statistical analysis with the tools, uh, computing tools and resources. And then you do some basic modeling in that sense. But what would happen if you take things to extreme and how, how far can you run this? Well, in simple terms, we can use modeling. And if we include some predictive components with machine learning or artificial intelligence, right? Then that modeling uh, takes on a whole different uh, capacity as a tool for analysis. Put another way, we can simulate things that would otherwise be infeasible with natural methods. So one of the realities of supercomputing in the late 60s and early 70s was the realization that if we use supercomputers after we had conducted so many atomic blasts for nuclear weapons testing, um, the downside was that we were poisoning, poisoning the continents. So entire continents were being poisoned when you set off nuclear weapons for testing, even in remote locations, that stuff vaporized and then collected up in the upper atmosphere. And with the rotation of the earth and the weather patterns, it basically spread out and, and there were nearby continents, not, not countries, entire continents that were being poisoned. And the rate of serious and lethal cancers uh, increased dramatically. And one of the realities of our nuclear arms race was that we could no longer continue to perform first above ground nuclear weapons testing and then below ground nuclear weapons testing. It didn't matter. The thinking was, well, we'll do it underground. We'll, we'll uh, drill a large cavern uh, down uh, 100 meters uh, below the surface of the earth and then we'll drop a nuke down the middle of that 100 meter hole and then we'll seal it off with concrete and we'll cover it over like it's any other part of the bedrock and then we'll go ahead and detonate that nuclear weapon underground. Um, would anyone care to guess what uh, what happens? What gets polluted when you blast a nuclear weapon underground? Plant. Say again? Plants or anything that relies on them, really. Well, a good many things above them. So yeah, there's a potential for toxic topsoil. Yeah. What else? What else? What else do you get out of the ground that we need to drink? That we need water. To... Um, yeah. yeah, water, right? Yes. So, food supplies, things like that. Oh, that could be contaminated. Oh yeah, there can be dramatic, uh, dramatic results. And the simple truth is, we can use these these models, these methods to predict what happens if we change certain parameters for a nuclear weapon and it's actually very reliable. So all of the nations banded together when they realized, wait a minute, we can do this with supercomputers. We can save the planet. So they came up with, uh, basically they all agreed and signed a treaty that we would no longer perform nuclear weapons testing, uh, real nuclear weapons testing instead we would use uh, computing simulations because of the modeling capabilities that you can take further, right? So this, these concepts are incredibly powerful and it's what we wanted to encounter and embrace and experience 
as a part of our last module for the season. And uh, some of these are actually really easy to perform uh, to scale. And so the same methods that you're going to encounter for your assignments and your solutions can, can be extended um, to do quite a bit more. So I, I know that um, when you look at module four and you look and you see there's only three or four topics, but then you look at the number of assignments, uh, that, that may be a little uh, daunting. But what I'd like to encourage you to do is to get into it and dive into it and try these first uh first ones quickly and then and then you'll start to understand i think you it's easier to understand the material you're reading if you actually walk through the hands-on part of it as well so any questions before we continue we have about 15 minutes left and what I'd like to do is touch on something that's actually very important. It has to do with the repeatability of experimental methods. And then uh, on Thursday, we'll get into specific types of descriptive and inferential analysis. Do we have any uh, students in our group today that have participated in the ECS Scholars Undergraduate Summer Research Program? Or RISE? Or Marine Science? Or NASA? Not the one that just passed, but I've been on ECS Scholar before. Yes, thank you. <laughs> So part of the fun of undergraduate research is understanding some of the common methods that you can share uh, with colleagues around the world. In order for um, your results, your outcomes to be fully appreciated, it's really important to be able to reproduce uh, the results. When you report on what you did and how you did, it's absolutely essential that in order to verify and identify patterns with reliability, others who are working on this have to know additional information. Now, these are things that really aren't stressed a whole lot in your textbook. But the simple truth is uh, the devil's in the detail. You may have heard that phrase before. So if you're going to uh, perform a series of trials and you want to collect data and perform measurements, uh, there's an aspect of that process that you have to work on the sideline or actually in the middle of it that you also need to log and document. And this is where uh, non-computational non uses of technology come into play. You need to video record, you need to audio record, uh, you need to log notes about simple things. Like here's a here's a very simple, a very simple idea. Let's say you're doing some chemistry research with one of our faculty. And um, in some cases, your colleagues are going to be fascinated with your results so they want to go ahead and perform the same they want to see if the relationship you identified is true and this is this is how we how our scientific method uh holds the potential to advance our race right we can we, we can get to a place someday hopefully soon where we cure cancer or end world hunger or poverty I mean, everybody talks about Wakanda, and I'm not trying to plug Wakanda here or the Marvel Universe, but the notion of ending hunger and a lot of the things that motivate uh, some of the evils in our world, th th this is where the real potential exists. The trick is to get everybody to start pulling together on the same page. So if we take this simple example of a chemistry experiment, 
And some are using Erlenmeyer flasks and round bottom flasks or volumetric flasks. Does everybody understand what I mean when I talk about that? Erlenmeyer versus, do we have any chemistry students in here, physics students in here? I'm a physics major. Is it like plastic or? Well, it's not the material so much as the shape. So Erlenmeyer flask. So let's look at some images, right? So if you're in a laboratory environment and you have a source of heat, like a Bunsen burner or a hot plate, uh, a flat bottomed flask or an Erlenmeyer flask, it's uh, graduated. So the volume is easy to read. So as you're doing volume, you're gauging changes in volume or you're working that, it's just handy. But the other, the other aspect is that the interface is flat. And that's significant because how much heat something will pick up during a given experiment is going to differ than if you have a volumetric flask, right? Now, a volumetric flask is going to be round-bottomed. It's going to have a different shape, and the amount of area that it's going to expose to the heat will differ from an Erlenmeyer flask. Now, a round bottom flask is going to be even more extreme. Round bottom flasks are used intentionally for a reason because of their shape. I mean, otherwise, it would be just simple to make all one type of flask, right? Well, that seems like a trivial, a very trivial thing. But the differences between Erlenmeyer round bottom and volumetric when it comes to a heat source and the type of heat source can be profound. So when people are trying to repeat your experiments so that they can realize or validate or confirm the same outcomes and validate with their own measurements, you know, this is, this is really where the magic happens. And uh, every time humans have encountered even accidents, if they kept if they kept notes, and it was a happy accident, and it's as simple as, well, as long as we've been doing this, we've been using round bottom flasks. The supplier burned to the ground. There was a warehouse fire, and round bottom flasks are no longer av available. So we switched to volumetric. And those have some aspect of flat. They couldn't use Erlenmeyer before, right? So maybe there was a premature conclusion based on the pattern of outcomes. And somebody said, hey, based on the inferential statistics, we can conclude that there's a relationship between the use of Erlenmeyer flasks and production failures when we're trying to produce an affordable product for sale, right? So say we're talking about scientific research and development in the context of a manufacturing plant. So let's pretend that uh, the first round of data that was gathered uh, positively concluded uh, that uh, there was a correlation between Erlenmeyer and, and failure in the factory. And, um, and let's pretend that... Um, volumetric or i'm sorry round bottom was the way to go so something that was purely round had better had better results with fewer failures but then let's pretend that uh, the manufacturer uh, the supply chain evaporates and you're stuck with volumetric right if the information that you've captured about your experiment the type of output sensors the lab analyzers Agricultural research is just as vulnerable to this kind of thing. So if you're doing if you're doing research in uh, a field or with um, seedlings, the simple truth is the additional detail is really important when you're setting the stage to repeat experiments. Put another way, you can spend a huge amount of time working on the statistics, but if you don't mind the simple, method, record keeping, 
the non-numerical context, the conceptual framework for the investigation. What are we looking at and why are we doing it? If those things aren't committed to the record for the things you're pursuing, your analysis, your data analysis is going to, it's going to be frustrating for other people. And at the end of the day, it's not the statistics that's failed. It's the other pieces of the experimental process. Now, we're going to examine the statistical aspects. In our final, in our final module, we're all about pattern recognition. But in order to set the stage for success, you have to mind the, the non-numerical and uh, other attributes, the context elements, right, of, of the things that you're investigating. And if you don't make a note of that, other people will follow in your footsteps. They'll perform the same statistical tools and methods. They'll come up with different results. And it'll look bad for you, and you'll think, okay, uh, the statistics failed me, or my method with uh, inferential statistics, I picked the wrong thing. No, a lot of times it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what kind of automatic, what, what kind of experimental methods you're doing. Now, when you, you stumble onto a discovery and you want to take it to scale, so you want to make a commercial venture out of it. This is another reason why the meticulous capture of other detail is so important. You might find that everything works fine on a small scale, but it doesn't work well in a factory. Why is that? Well, it could be as simple as some, some other context, some other components that have to do with the experimental context. At the end of the day, your statistical analysis can help identify those differences. So if you're supposed to get a, if you're not supposed to have a difference in a statistical outcome and you do, it raises and it presents an opportunity for you to do some, some additional investigation, right? But to me, it's ironic when you use the same identical calculations to analyze similar sets of experimental data, but you end up with very different outcomes. And that's kind of a head scratcher. Put another way, I wanted to start our review of module four material with a disclaimer, right? And it kind of comes full circle, garbage in, garbage out. Part of garbage in is when we're not meticulous and intentional about recording the context, the framework, the you know the secret sauce, right? How is it we're doing what we're doing? Have you ever noticed that uh, three different restaurants can have the same entree on their menu? Is it true that because three different restaurants have the same entree on their menu that they're going to present that entree to their customers with the same degree of success? What does your own human experience tell you about that? Right? So I, I know it seems like there's this extra stuff here and it seems that, oh, I was in a science fair. I don't need to read this. Please take the time to read it. Okay, what we've done is condense some things about our scientific method and other process. And um, it's worth the time that it takes to uh, to read through this this first uh, this first objective in our study guide. There's also a lot of misconceptions about the term hypothesis and prediction. Uh, some of you may already be read in on that. Uh, I'll go ahead and ask you to go ahead and uh, start reading in the study guide and we'll take up where we've left off on Thursday. <laughs>